To start, really, uh, I have been one of the very few people, I and my organization have been uh, of the very few people who have been extremely skeptic about the Egyptian revolution from the very beginning, if not outright opposed to it. Uh, there are so many reasons for that, and I have, I have previously spoken with Michael and with Jonathan uh, about it. Um, the, I, would, I would sketch out um, um, these reasons right now for you, and then we, we, can, we can have a discussion. I prefer the discussion uh, form much, much better than the lecture form, so, uh, and I, I, I tend to uh, be much more eloquent when, I, when I'm asked questions. Other than when I have to speak. So, <laughs> basically, uh, let's put it this way. Uh, you have a few myths about the Hayes Square, about, about the revolution. Um, first of all, that it was a liberal revolution. Um, it wasn't, really. Um, there were various groups involved in the Hayes Square movement um, at different times including the Islamists. This is another myth that the Islamists were not involved. The Muslim Brotherhood announced their participation in the 23rd of January. So they were there, not necessarily on the 25th, but definitely after the 28th. And they played a great, the 28th of January, and they played a huge role in protecting the revolution afterwards. Um, there were um, groups like uh, the soccer fans, known as the ultras, the football fans, uh, who have this kind of um, a very difficult relationship with the police. They engage in violence with the police after every football game. Uh, anybody who knows anything about Egypt knows that there are two big football teams, Ahli and Zamalek, uh, and each, each of these two teams have, have their ultras. They engage with each other and they, they engage with the police. They were in Tahrir Square from the very beginning and they took a very important role in destroying the police forces and the police stations. I mean, this is also another myth. It was a non-violent revolution. Anybody who believes it was a non-violent revolution should come to Cairo and tour the 99, at least 99, police stations that are burned down. So, that was another thing. Um, there were the lefties. These are the ones that I kind of, uh, that, that I'm competing with uh, for the title liberal, because everybody believes that uh, those on the left are liberals, uh, not in my country, not really. Um, I'm talking about Trotskites, anarcho-syndicalists, stuff like this. Uh, in my dictionary, these do not count as liberals. Um, there has been a, a discourse in Egypt for the past four or five years against the new liberal uh, policies of uh, the last government of Ahmad Nazif, uh, Prime Minister Ahmad Nazif, now in prison, uh, which has uh, enacted certain economic reforms which have been extremely successful. My intention was to show you a few indicators of what happened in the past five or six years in Mubarak's time, not before that, so nobody uh, thinks that I'm defending Mubarak, I'm defending the Nazif government. Uh, it has taken certain um, measures that have, I mean, I can talk about indications for a very long time, but still, one of the main arguments, one of the main discourses that have taken on over Egyptian society in the past four or five years that is that uh, Egypt was becoming, was being stolen by uh, capitalist cronies, or crony capitalism, whatever you want to call it, and that the Egyptians were, uh, and this, this, is, this was the main chant in Tahrir Square, bread, freedom, social justice. Now, I'm not really, it's the country where, the, where bread is the cheapest in the world. No other country has cheaper prices of bread. We're talking about less than one cent per loaf of bread, one American cent per loaf of bread. Of course, less than, what's smaller than one euro cent? I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, uh, we're also talking about a country that, that, pay, that uh, 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 where uh, subsidies of food and fuel make up more than one-fourth of government expenditure. Mm -hmm. uh, we're talking about a country that pays $11 billion in, the two, in 2008, $11 billion to subsidize fuel. We're talking, 
Egypt is the fourth cheapest country when it comes to gasoline prices. So, as I said, in, in, the, in the last, uh, of course, the, the other cheaper countries are Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, and Nigeria, for obvious reasons. Five is Kuwait, so Egypt is actually, it actually sells its oil for less price than Kuwait. So, in the, in the past few years, Egypt, ha Egypt has been taken over by what I call the Jacobin discourse, which is uh, a radical uh, narrative of people who are rich should not be rich, and that mo most Egyptians live in horrid circumstances. We, most, in, in, in many cases, people would flaunt in your face uh, the, uh, the number that 40% of the Egyptians live under the poverty line which is actually not true, it's 25%, but let's leave it at 40. We're talking about the, 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 the poverty line of $2 per day, not the abject poverty line, which is $1.25 per day. India has 75%. Does India need a revolution? So that's a good question. So, this is not to say that there were not good people in Tahrir Square. Of course there were good people in Tahrir Square. There were people who are human rights activists, there were people who were uh, opposed to the undemocratic ways of the Mubarak regime, but this was not the main drive behind the revolution. So, aside from the Islamists, who make up, as you now will know, who make up the, the, not only the most important, but the predominantly important political force in the country, the other discourses that were being applied, being applied at Tahrir were not particularly liberal. So, today, we are at a very, very difficult situation. The economy is stagnating. Egypt, the, the state is on the version of bankruptcy. The state itself is facing uh, the possibility of complete collapse. Uh, I don't know if you know that, but the uh, gas, uh, the natural gas exporting line to Israel and Jordan has been bombed for the ninth time. This this uh, this month uh, after January nine times you can imagine the security situation in the Sinai how it looks like uh, the Islamists have won some 68 percent of the seats in the first phase of the parliamentary elections um, my my and my friends prediction is that it actually is going to go higher than that because the first uh, the first phase had uh, more urban districts. Well, you've been to. Um, but yes, uh, next next stage is going to have a few urban districts from Giza. Third stage doesn't have any urban districts at all. So Islamists are going to win big. Um, I make no distinction. And this is one thing that you mentioned was was uh, talked about before I came. I make no distinction between Muslim Brotherhood and and Salafists. None whatsoever. Not because they are the same, they are extremely different. But the difference is, the Muslim Brotherhood is pragmatic, it's political, it, it, um, it responds to external pressures, and it's very malleable, it adjusts to the circumstances. The Salafists are very idealist. So how come that I make no distinction? It's simply because the greatest pressure that the Muslim Brotherhood is going to be facing is the pressure from the Salafists. So, with, with, nothing, with nothing more than, I, I would say, I mean, the Salafists are going to get some, somewhere between 15-25% of the, of the seats, we don't know yet, but even if they get 5%, their sheer presence in the parliament is sufficient to push the Muslim Brotherhood very far to the right. Because if the Muslim Brotherhood say, we want to apply this policy, the Salafist guy will come up and say, well, you are being hypocritic. You're supposed to be Muslim. Where's, where's, where's your Islam? I mean, and obviously the Muslim Brotherhood appeals to a particular, to the, the, the person who votes for the Muslim Brotherhood wants them to be, uh, to be more um, purist in their policies, not pragmatic. The person who votes for the Muslim Brotherhood does not vote for them to provide for bread and butter. He votes for them for different reasons. So, with, with the Salafists pushing every, the, the entire political discourse to the right, the Muslim Brotherhood is going to be, to be acting even, I think, I believe they might even be more rigid 
in their actions than the Salafists. So, that's uh, another myth. Um, one final thing about the, 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 uh, the role of the military in all, in all this, and then we can open the discussion. The, you, you will hear this often, you read it in the, in the newspapers, you see it on TV, that the, the, the military is really the Mubarak regime in a new form, and that the revolution needs to continue, and all of this, uh, excuse me, nonsense. The, the military, in, in the last 20 years of Mubarak's reign, he has managed since the, uh, he, he removed the Minister of Defense, Abu Ghazala, Muhammad Abdul Harim Abu Ghazala, in 91. Uh, since he removed this Minister of Defense and brought in Tantawi as Minister of Defense, the Mubarak regime has managed to completely neuter, castrate, uh, emasculate the military through basically making a bureaucratic, bureaucratizing the military. How is that? Anybody who had, who had any political, political ambition, ambition, anybody who showed any, any sort of um, interest in politics was completely cut out from the military from the very beginning. And it was transformed in these 20 years into this very big company, more or less. It owns a lot of businesses. Any general who retires goes into either local administration or into these very big army businesses. So. The army does not really have an ideology. Even worse, the army is not very, the, the military is not very aware of its own interests. How is how's that possible? It's simple because everybody thinks of themselves as a bureaucrat. Everybody from the field marshal downwards. Everybody thinks that he has been appointed to this position by somebody else, of a, by, by the institution by this very big ghost. And he has, this person would have no problem whatsoever going home the next day if he has, if he's fired. So, it, as I said, it runs as a very, and, and I think in Germany you know a little bit about bureaucracy. It runs, it runs, it has, the, the institution has its own soul in a sense. And it's completely ideology free. It does not want to maintain any interests and it's just acting on day-to-day -day basis. Anybody who tells you that the military is evil is wrong. The military is neither evil or good. I'm not defending them. I'm just saying that they have, they are, as I said, it's a, it's a, it's a security company with other, investing in other branches, in, other, in different other uh, portfolios. So, those who hate the military and those who love the military are wrong. The military is not going to save us and it's not going to ruin our lives. It's just there. It's not going to do anything. The real fight is going to be between whatever liberals there are, very few, and the Islamists. Nothing else. Forget about the military, um, and so on and so forth. Now, uh, I, I, should, I should leave it to the floor. I know that people want to ask about foreign policy, what's going to happen between Egypt and Israel, what's going to happen between Egypt and Iran, but I, I should leave it to questions. Is that... Oh, oh, I I mean, we, we can open it, but, but if you would just that you mentioned it. Right. Yes. Well, it's, it's really difficult to predict what's going to happen with foreign policy. Really difficult, because it depends really on how uh, shrewd, how prudent the Muslim Brotherhood is going to be. Uh, whether they would like to take over this as, as, as I mean, what happened in Tunisia, for example, is that uh, al Mahdar, the Islamist party that won the elections, um, wanted three major uh, portfolios in the cabinet. They wanted foreign affairs, they wanted education, and they wanted culture, for obvious reasons. Um, now, if, if I were in the place of the Muslim Brotherhood, I will, not take, I will not take foreign policy. I will leave it to the military to run it in their own way, because they will either have to moderate and then they will be attacked by the Salafists and by their own constituencies, or they will have to be really aggressive, and then it will be very problematic. So, my, my, my own assumption is that there are not going to be too many, there are going to be problems, but there are not going to be too big problems in the next few years. Uh, the, uh, insofar as the Muslim Brotherhood 
the Islamists in general and the Muslim Brotherhood in particular stays away from the foreign policy uh, file. Iran is going to be extremely problematic because the Salafists hate Shiites more than they hate Jews. <laughs> which is, which is, which is, uh, this is, this is, this is quite, this is quite well known by the, I mean, anybody who knows Saudi Arabia a little bit understands this very, this very well. So, uh, for prospects of, of Egyptian-Iranian cooperation, uh, they are not very, they are not very bright. However, Egypt could be worse than an Iran. Uh, I know that the, the, the nuclear, uh, bomb issue is the atomic bomb issue is a, is a big issue here in this crowd and in this for this organization um, and uh, if, if at least we have with Iran we have the idea of thinking about um, things like deterrence and uh, uh, manipulation containment things like that Egypt is going to be Egypt does not really need a nuclear, nuclear bomb to be really problematic because we are, remember who's on the on the eastern border. Um, what is more dangerous is actually this kind of uh, is is a new Islamist axis in North Africa. You've seen what happened in Tunisia. You've seen what happened in Morocco. Libya is not going to be uh, extremely nice, and I think the Algerian president is freaking out because he's had this kind of experience 20 years ago. So, and, 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 uh, and uh, Gabbat al Qad, the Islamist, the, the Islamist party in, in Algeria is extremely strong. So, this kind of North African Islamist axis with a growing Turkish role in, in the region, with, um, it could be, could be extremely annoying for, for Israel. Nobody, nobody knows what's going to happen in, in Syria. Um, so, Israel is in a very difficult situation. Um, is, it, is, it, uh, is it going to be more dangerous than Iran? My contention is yes. Is it, um, is it going to work with Iran? My contention is no. I think, uh, have I? Okay, so thank you for your presentation. Um, but, uh, we, I think we can just open the floor quite quickly. Uh, I will also have some questions later on, but uh, I will not start with what is I think. Uh, first question back to the military. So you think that they won't do anything uh, opposed politically to the Muslim world? Perhaps they will, uh, they will fight back if they attack as an institution, as a, as a Enterprise, but not on not let's say to protect some kind of secularism and Turkey. nationalism against uh, Islamism. Or the, what, what, what the analysts have called Turkey one, Turkey before before. Yeah. 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 No, uh, I actually I actually do believe that the military is not going to do anything that is more than protect its own interests. There's a big fight in Egypt right now about the uh, independence of the military in the new constitution. Uh, a faction of the liberals. <coughs> has been pushing for an article in the Constitution that gives the army independence with its own budget. Uh, that, the, that the budget should not be uh, put under uh, parliament uh, control. control. Which, which was really a big fight and the, and the Islamists took it to the extreme. And uh, I think either way, whether the military is, is, uh, is independent in the Constitution or isn't, the military is part of the Egyptian state. And once, uh, I've actually just written that yesterday in Arabic, once the Islamists start, understand that it's not very easy to, to, to um, interfere with the armies, with the military's internal business, they will just, they will understand very easily that it's much easier to take over the state and the military will come its own. Take everything else and the military will have to, to, have, will have to, will have to obey. We have, we have various experiences in history about that. Uh, I mean, not least the Wehrmacht. So, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm right about that. So, in, 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 in any case, so I, I want to warn of two tendencies. The first is to think that the military is going to fight the fight for us. 
to fight the fight for a sane foreign policy, to fight the fight for uh, a liberal economy, whatever, or, or a liberal Egypt, it's not going to happen. This is this is this is the this is a, uh, a wrong assumption. The other wrong assumption that I'm against is to argue that the military is the source of all evil, and we have to bring it down. The revolution must 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 continue. So both are wrong. I would say. Thank you very much for your very straightforward talk. Um, I, I'm very interested in your thesis that uh, the Salafis will drive the Muslim Brotherhood to the right. From what I understand, the Muslim Brotherhood is at least a little bit diverse. They have women in different, even uh, supreme committees. They have a lot of women in parliament. Do you really think that they're all going to send their women home or send the women home? They're all going to grow large beards because of the pressure from the Salafi? Or is it not more likely that they're going to split? That the Muslim Brotherhood is going to split in at least two groups. One is going with the Salafis, one is going to, because it's the only other way, in the other direction. It might help to be a little bit more pluralistic and diverse in the political system in Egypt. Well, once again, um, I would put this very straightforward, as you said. The, you hear a, very, a lot about, about the Muslim Brotherhood and the uh, and the diversity within the Muslim Brotherhood and the moderation of the Muslim Brotherhood, all this is absolutely not true. We've, we've in, 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 you know, in the way of, I mean, around April or May, there was a trend in Western press to talk about the groups that are leaving the Muslim Brotherhood. I don't know if you remember that. The youth, various groups, and there was, there was a huge uh, fuss about these new parties, a new, a new party called Hezbo al Masri, the Egyptian current or uh, mainstream movement or whatever, and there was this guy, Islam Lutfi, who was a Muslim Brotherhood operative, and he became really famous because he's critical of Muslim Brotherhood, and then the, the, the youth said that they're going to have a revolution within the Muslim Brotherhood. All of this is complete nonsense. This, these, I mean, these are fringe groups. The Muslim Brotherhood, uh, first of all, there are two things that we have to understand. The Muslim Brotherhood is not the leadership of the Muslim Brotherhood. This is, this, is, this is very important. When you look at the Muslim Brotherhood, the way that the, the uh, guidance office is run, uh, and, and uh, you will understand that there are people that you see on TV all the time. Some al Ariyan, al Futuh before he left, uh, Muhammad Habib before he was fired. If, if you, and sometimes the Supreme Guide, although they are very uh, cautious about getting the Supreme Guide on TV because he tends to make stupid mistakes. <laughs> but if you take a look at the strongest man in the Supreme, in the, in, the, in the guidance office of the Muslim Brotherhood, who's the man who's responsible for the organization, his name is Mahmoud Izzet. I challenge you to find his name in an English newspaper or nobody knows who he is. What's his name? Mahmoud Izzet. Ma 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 Mahmoud Izzet. E Z Z A T. Doesn't speak to the press, nobody really knows it. I mean, I always, I mean, people say that the, the, the guidance office of the, I mean, nobody knows how many people are in the guidance office of the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, I'm talking about in the West. Uh, nobody knows any other names other than the ones that you see on TV. Um, actually, the, the Muslim Brotherhood is a very, um, deep down, the Muslim Brotherhood is a very different organization from what you see on TV. But they also, as I said, it's a very pragmatic organization. They also understand that the leaders are doing this for the greater benefit. They can, they can compromise, they can say stuff to, to appeal to the, to, the, to the West and to, uh, and to the, uh, the pressures that they are facing. But they are still our leaders. But the people deep down inside are actually no better than the Salafists, with the exception of the leaders. And the complete thing, the complete face cover. So th this is this is one thing. The, uh, the structure of the Muslim Brotherhood itself, especially in the rural areas, is not is not what you think it is. It's not that diverse at all. It's... Second thing is that there is a tendency, a growing tendency within Islamist movements in the entire world towards Salafization, because the Salafists have a stronger argument and. Here's another mistake that is done very frequently in the West, to equate Salafism and Jihadism. 
Salafism is not jihadism. The Salafists that exist today have existed 30 or 40 years ago, if not before that, and they have never taken up arms against anybody. They may justify the acts of jihadists, they may say that Osama bin Laden is a martyr, but they themselves have never been pro-violence. They are a different thing. It, it, really, people do not understand what the Salafists are all about. They are not the superficial, uh, uh, Saudi money-backed, uh, you know, desert tent type of people at all. They are also uh, very, sometimes very Western educated, sometimes very highly educated. If you take a look at Egypt's leading Salafists, you find out that the, the, uh, the Salafist school of Alexandria is made up of entirely of, of physicians, doctors. Entirely, or everybody. Uh, the, one of the strongest uh, 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 focus points for the Salafists is Alexandria. Very strange, an urban, allegedly cosmopolitan city. The Salafists are, are doing very well there. They are modern people. They look different. They, 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 are, they, are, they, are, they are not crazy, fringe, uh, as I said, desert fighters type of people at all. They are modern people. Uh, as I said, the, the, the leaders of the Salafist school of Alexandria will be surprised at how many of them speak English, for example. But what is their aim, then? What, what's their aim? I, I'd like to, what are they? Who are they? What do they want? They want to... They are proposing a form of civilization of resistance. They want to do away with everything that is modern and Western. Yes. And to replace it with a model of politics that is based on the, the, uh, the guided caliphate, the prophet's mm -hmm. uh, state and the guided caliphate. Mm -hmm. They totally accept technology and the ways of the modern world, but they reject everything else. Mm -hmm. So, but w once again, they are not, they are, they, are, they, they, they are not at all crazy. I mean, I mean, I don't like them, but uh, but they they are not they are not ignorant, uneducated, poor. All these arguments that you hear that it's because of poverty that people choose these things. It's because of uh, ignorance that there's not enough education. I mean, one of I'll give you a simple example. One of the one of the leading Salafist leaders in Egypt, a scholar, uh, by has a name Abu Sahab Hoi. He is a graduate of the Faculty of Languages. Uh, uh, he has a degree in Spanish language and literature. He is sent by the Egyptian state and the Thebantes Institute to Spain in the early 70s uh, for a scholarship. He spends three months there and comes back with the intention or the, with the uh, uh, completely convinced that the West, that the West is not is not is not right about the way the way, the way it lives its life and more like Sayyid Qutb but in a Sayyid, Sayyid Qutb was not a, 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 a religious scholar was not a theologian he was he was a, also a freedom fighter that's why he or, or he had the mentality of a freedom fighter but uh, but this person that I'm talking about he he came out thinking that the Western way of life is not not only is not suitable for us as, as Egyptians and Muslim, as Muslims, but it's wrong, outright wrong. So, um, they, have, they have criticism of everything. I mean, you will, you will say to them the rights of women, they will, say, they will respond to you and is, is showing naked women in uh, uh, cola drink advertisement uh, women's rights? Uh, you, will, you, will, you will talk to them, I mean, you, you, you will say to them, you are objectifying women. You will say, we are objectifying women, you are the ones who have pornography. So, they are not, they are not at all uh, lunatics. They have, they have arguments that should be addressed. So, I hope I have answered the question. I've got uh, three questions. Yes. Uh, the first, the first one is, how many unorthodox uh, has achieved Egypt. Uh, the second one, uh, 
I'm interested, maybe you know something about it, um, about the voters, female and male ones. Uh, the, who, who, who did vote, if you know, who did what, what do you think are the um, Muslim brothers and who the Salafis and because of what? And the third one is uh, what's about uh, relationships, relationship uh, between uh, these, um, you know, the main groups, political groups or other groups, military groups. Uh, okay. Okay. So, so the first question again, please. Uh, I will just remind you. What's, what's the first one? Uh, how many illiterate? Ah, yes. Twenty-five percent. Less than twenty-five percent. Um. Yeah. Um. By the way, was, I mean, I I can see the underlining. Uh, issue here. Once again, I have I have to tell you that out of uh, if, if you look at the, the, the <coughs> guidance office of the Muslim Brotherhood, it looks like a university professors club. It's like doctor, whatever, PhD, and whatever. So, it, it, one of one of the key arguments that we have to really focus on is not is that Islamists are not getting these votes because people are ignorant. Islamists are getting these votes because they are successful in propaganda and they have clear arguments about what they want. So it's 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 not that they uh, it's not that they that they are ignorant or deceived or bribed or I mean Another question that people will be asking is, is it true that the Muslim Brotherhood has all these hospitals and all these schools and they are giving people uh, social services in order for them to... It's not the point. The point is that they have a political discourse. So, as a matter of fact, the Muslim Brotherhood gets more votes. I mean, the Muslim Brotherhood won the elections of the engineer syndicate, the doctor syndicate. They are about to win the, uh, the uh, journalist syndicate. They are about to. They are about to win the. Uh, uh, I mean, the, everything. They 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 control everything. And as I said, also the Salafists are the leaders of the Salafists. At least are very educated people. So it, it's not really a matter of, of ignorance or, or or something like this. Your second question was. Uh, Turkey, the third one. No, no, that's the third one. The second one was. Oh, who voted? Well, we we don't have we don't have exit polls yet in Egypt, but I can tell you this from from personal observation and from understanding my own country a little bit. First of all, much more uh, males than females vote. I don't know, Georg was there. Can you can you can you confirm that? I wouldn't say so. You you, you had schools where only women are, um, have, have voted. And you had schools where only men voted, and I, I would say there have been a lot of women voting. But on the on the other hand, you're right. The second day, only in schools where women were voting, it was a lot of people because um, Al Nur and um, and and, uh, and and um, the Brotherhood um, brought women to polling station. Oh yes, station. of course, of course. With cars, second yes, day. Yes, but, but but I mean. Um, but Moni, maybe you are right. I think I think especially in the countryside. The, the male uh, voting would be much higher than the, than the female vote. Uh, who votes in which direction? That's a very, very difficult question. But once again, as Georg just said, Muslim Brotherhood not only has this uh, complete control over political discussion in Egypt, the Islamists in general, but the Muslim Brotherhood has this incredible organizational machine. And also, also the Salafists. Every every single Salafist took his wife and his mother with him to to the ballot stations to vote. They are not they are not opposed to, it's to the three existence. wives probably. Well, once again, this is another prejudice. Uh, I have to, I have to tell you. I mean, I mean, most Salafists would not marry more than once. Well, <laughs> you see. Uh, no, I mean, I mean, you'd have, you'd have, there, you know, 
a few of them who would have many wives and stuff like this, but most of them are just just married ones. Uh, so, so uh, once again, the 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 how how ideological uh, or how how uh, gender based voting is it's, it's it's just it's just something that we do not know a lot about. But you also, I would not be surprised if it was if it was equally distributed between between the two, because really there is nothing. There is nothing to choose from. I mean, you either vote Islamist or you don't go to vote. That's simple. Uh, third question about Turkey. Well, of course, one, one thing that is uh, that is very well known is that the AKP in uh, in uh, in Turkey is more or less connected to the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, it's, it's very well known. It's connected to its uh, the Muslim Brotherhood has its relations with its four, four, uh, forerunner. The uh, the uh, I mean forerunners, the mini parties of Erbakan and and and, uh, and so on and so forth. So, but there's no organizational connection. If that's what you're asking about. There's the, they meet in ideological in in uh, if they meet in conferences. They have ideological common common grounds, but there are no organizational connections. As for the military, the 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 connection that is between the Egyptian military and the Turkish military is the Americans. So it goes this way. It, there's, there's, no, there's no... I mean, everything that the Egyptian military does, all the relations that the, Egyptian, that the Egyptian military have, is connected to the United States. Even the relationship with Israel. I mean, obviously the relationship with Israel, but with, with almost everybody else. So the, the bridge goes through Washington, D.C. <laughs> Um, I have a question. Uh, can you tell me the name again of the Salafist uh, guy, guy who went to, to Spain? Yes, uh, it's going to be very difficult. It's, it's not actually his real name. He's using a, a traditional name in the ways of the Prophet and his companions. It's, it's, it's Abu Ishaq al uh -huh. Okay, so he uh, he was in Spain and Sayyid Qutub also went to, um, to the West. And my question is, what do you think? To what extent is Islamism a reaction to Western life or to Western one hundred percent societies? Is it is it is it very strong? Is it is resentment against the West or is it to what extent it, it is an, an, a phenomenon of the uh, societies itself? Well, first of all, uh, I would say that it's one hundred percent caused by. By rejection of Western values and Western and Western and Western societies, it's a rejection of, of modernization. It's a, I mean, everybody is familiar with these arguments that that uh, fascism is a reaction to 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 modernity, and the Islamists are no different from that. Um, so, if you're I, I did not know if you're asking if, if the societies themselves have this sense of resentment to the West, or if you meant that the societies, that Islamism is embedded in societies, and it's it's not related so much to the hatred of the West. I mean, I think there must be something like uh, part of utopia, like an Islamist utopia that yes. works for itself, and then a part that is resentment against. But the, actually, the Islamist, the, the, the Western utopia, the uh, the Islamist utopia, did not exist before this sense of resist, the resentment existed. The, the, the beginning <coughs> of the Islamist project is when the Ottoman Empire collapses. Mm -hmm. And until then, nobody really had to think about a political, um, uh, a political solution for the uh, for the for, for the, the, what the what was the Islamist or the Muslim question. <coughs> The, exist, the mere existence of the caliphate had people think that oh, oh, we have we have our state, although it's completely impotent and uh, and, uh, and useless. But there is there is this umbrella that that and there is this history that goes back to the prophet. There's this caliphate, this caliphate, this caliphate, and it moves on. It moves. The collapse of the caliphate really created serious questions uh, about. I mean, why did the caliphate collapse? Turkey. Completely fell down uh, because of, because of it was a European uh, country, but it, it is thought of as that the Europeans brought down the caliphate. Mm -hmm. So 
And you would have these kinds of lines of thinking that this is what the West, the Christian West, has been doing since the Crusades. It's how to uh, bring Islam to an end. And this is exactly what happened in Turkey, or something like this. And so, this, this attitude of civilization resistance is what creates the Islamist utopia, or makes people think about this Islamist utopia. Nobody really took it to the extent of um, uh, creating a political theory until this resentment of the West existed. Mm -hmm. So, um, once again, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's really a clash of ideas, it's really a clash of values. Uh, and and uh, well, it's. Uh, I think I think this is this is also a question that was in the uh, uh, in the invitation to this talk. It's really to some extent up to the West to fix it. Um, what do you mean? Oh, um, <laughs> that's hard. Uh, tell us. Yeah, I, I think we should shift in this direction. Yes. <laughs> First of all, give up give up on multiculturalism. That's, 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 that's the first thing. I mean, uh, 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 what do you mean by that? Why? Say it again, what give up what please? You give up on multiculturalism. Yes, definitely. Okay. Thank you. Yes. So, the, 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 the idea that there is a political system that works for Muslims and a political system that works for uh, Europeans and a political system that and there are European values for Muslims and values for other people, this is, I think, is one of the main reasons why we're seeing this upsurge of Islamism in the homeland of the Western civilization in Europe and the United States and Canada and Israel. So, um, I, I think the... So it's more cultural about relativism and much cultural Maybe not exactly the same. Well, if you... Y yes, of course. Uh, cultural relativism... But... What's the difference then? I mean, I, I will ask you, what's the difference? <laughs> I mean, you can put a different emphasis, you know, uh, um, multiculturalism has uh, um, its, its problems, but still, uh, you know, since we are uh, sitting here in a uh, uh, NGO that's working, you know, against right-wing extremism, it's, mm -hmm. I can tell you it's really not not so that everybody in Germany is super multiculturalist, or some it's quite a new idea that not every, well, I think, everyone I think thinks the same, looks the same, etc., etc. The, the Western culture is the culture of individualism, is the culture of, of, of freedom of speech, which allows everybody to have their own culture as an individual. I think there's no need for multiculturalism, there's no need for introducing other cultures. There's one culture that allows for everybody to be themselves, which is the Western culture. And I, I have no qualms about that. I have no fears of saying that anywhere. I, as I, in, in the people who were at my, my final lecture at the Einstein uh, Forum, mm -hmm. uh, people often say that, that the, Western, the Western civilization is imperialist, uh, this uh, new human rights thing is, is new imperialism, whatever. I say if this is imperialism, then I'm an imperialist. A brown one. But, but I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm an imperialist in this. And, and, and I say with, with, with this is and I said this in my, in my uh, lecture in the Einstein Forum. That this is going to sound very politically incorrect, but uh, one of the most famous imperialist slogans comes from uh, Rudyard Kipling's poem, White Man's Burden. And my response when I read White Man's Burden, I say, I wish it were true. Because this was not, this was not what imperialism was about. It was not about uh, cultivating uh, certain values, or what was uh, was not about uh, uh, um, reforming educational systems, or was not about molding the minds of of the uh, uh, the people under colonialism in a certain way. It was about theft, nothing more. Uh, so, if if somebody was actually spreading culture, I would I would I would have loved that. I mean, we would not be in this in this position that we are today. So. Um, one of the main problems of uh, is so, as I said, Islamism is a reaction to um, the Western way of living, the Western worldview, and while it has been on its on its path to growth, the West itself is not is not what it was uh, when when this challenge began. Uh, Leo Strauss puts it 
really clearly. He says that the, pro the crisis of the West is that the West is not sure of its purpose anymore. Um, so, what one of one of the major problems that we are facing um, as as uh, as liberals working in a difficult environment in Egypt is that afterwards yeah. just finish <laughs> one of one of the major problems that we're facing is that uh, when you want to deal with Western uh, uh, supporters with Western friends they do not want to uh, offend another culture they don't want we do not want to, to do anything partisan they do not want to do anything that has to do with ideas all they want to do is do procedural stuff development and democracy and democracy means ballot box democracy I'll, you know I'll, I'll pay money for monitoring elections the, the United States the State Department of the United States has injected more than 80 million dollars in Egypt and Tunisia since January 80 million dollars all went in the direction of monitoring elections, making sure that the process is fair, which is okay, but in the end, this is not where the, where the, where the Islamist money is going. The Islamist money is not, is, not, is not going to monitoring elections and making sure that the process is fair. It's going to uh, making sure that we win the process, no matter how it's fair or isn't. So, I'll leave it at this point. Uh, I've got another question, but, but if you're talking about money, where did those 1.3 billion Saudi money go, uh, went to? Uh, I heard the figures on, uh, on the news uh, that <clears throat> even the, the slightest bit that the West could do with his money uh, uh, wouldn't have any chance against that amount of money being pumped in by Saudi Arabia. Uh, and the other question I would like to ask is, can you give us a little bit of insight of the situations of the Copts in, in Egypt? Uh, were there any parties? How did they vote? Uh, uh, uh. Well, uh, first of all, I, I really do not like the Saudi, the Saudi money argument. Really. Uh, uh, well, first of all, I'm quite sure that there is money coming from the Gulf. I'm not saying it's, it's, not, it's not true. I'm just saying it's extremely exaggerated and it's not what makes Islamism viable. Islamism lives on a set and a very clear ideology and they are the only, the, the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafists are not, are the only groups who are actually members are paying money for their cause. The Muslim Brotherhood, five, every member of the Muslim Brotherhood pays 5% of his income or her income to support the Muslim Brotherhood. We don't have anything like that anywhere else. Okay? So, so even if, there's, if there are tons of money coming from, coming from the Gulf, into, from Qatar or from anywhere else, uh, into the hands of the Islamists, one thing that I know is that the Islamists are not getting rich from it. And I'm uh, not making any references. Uh, so, uh, I mean, if you take a look at these leaders of Islamists that I'm talking about, they appear on TV 24 hours and they have all the commercials and they have, and they, and they have as, as, as many say, Saudi money and Qatari money, but they drive simple cars and they have simple apartments and they, nobody's getting rich, really. So, even if they're getting money, they're spending it the right way. That's, that's one thing. Um, that's, that's, that's for the first uh, question, I hope. So, the, the issue, I, 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 before, I, before I, go, I go to the second point, the issue with Western money is not competing with Saudi money or Qatari money. It's just making sure that the money goes to something that makes a difference, even if the money is little. It's, it's a, it's a, that doesn't, I mean, 80 million dollars worth enough to make something. Okay, so, so that's, that's the first, uh, that's the first uh, point. The second point, um, the Copts. Well, uh, there is this very famous Egyptian businessman, the richest man in Egypt. His name is Nagib Sawirus. Uh, he's, he's Coptic, and he uh, had some role during the revolution, but after the revolution, he established this new party, which is called the Masri al Harar Free, uh, Free Egyptians. Uh, and then, during the elections, formed something called the Kutla al Masriya, the Egyptian bloc, which came third in the elections after uh, the, uh, the, Salafists, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafists. 
And it only came third because the church, the Coptic community, was mobilized out of the senses to vote for this party. Every single Christian vote went to the Egyptian bloc. And, uh, and the, the, as I said, the church was completely mobilized. They got old women. And the only people who actually worked the same way that the Islamists did work, which tells you something about religion in my country. Um, the Coptic community is in a very difficult position, really. Um, they, I do not think that they will face too much violence. I mean, there will be the sporadic events that we see every now and then. I mean, we haven't had one for a while, so maybe it's going to happen in the next few months. I hope not, but that's, that's the way things go. But also, under the Islamists, the Copts are safer than under anybody else. Not because the Islamists will grant them rights or whatever, but just because they will make sure that they get at, as, as less problems as they, as they can because of Copts. So the Salafists that went and burnt a church when, his, when, uh, when Mubarak was in government is not going to do so, not to embarrass his government when he's, when he's in government. Uh, however, the pressure, the daily pressure on Copts is increasing. You live in a country where you know that 70% of the people hate you. So you just try to leave. Uh, and um, the, the numbers that we have, although they are not, they are not really uh, trustworthy, but the numbers that we have is about 100,000 100, cops left Egypt since, since January. I would say it's less, but still it's very significant. Um, and uh, I think we are going to witness uh, mass migration in, in the next few years. There's nothing that we can, uh, that we can really do about it. Um, but as I said, I don't think that the violence will, will erupt into something that looks like pogroms or uh, something like that. The Islamists will make sure that nothing like this happens. They still need a kind of an international image. and They still need to maintain the, the image of the good people, the persecuted. So, so I don't think that the violence will increase. Um, but I think that the situation will get worse, at least morally, for Copts. If I may, just one question. Um, uh, since, since we are somehow we're talking about um, uh, Western policy and what we can do, maybe uh, I'd like to ask you one question. And uh, we already talked about this uh, when, when we met. Um, I'd like to uh, um, talk about three uh, figures, persons who uh, I think everyone has heard of them. Um, the first one was uh, Abdul Karim Nabil. Um, there was this free Karim uh, um, campaign. So, Karim? I'm not, Nabil is not Nabil. Yeah. Okay, okay, sorry. Um, so, this uh, campaign um, to uh, free him it was a blogger. And, free Karim, yes. And what he did was, I think, that his, his worst thing, he, he uh, insulted. The president, but also Islam. He said it's Islam and the president. We've got three years for Islam and one year for the president. Yes. <laughs> so, so we have one person who is really uh, uh, speaking out uh, like, like uh, in a blasphemic way against uh, religion. Then the next person, uh, Michael Nabil Sanat, who uh, is, as, as far as I know, today is his 113th day of hunger strike. Yes. Um, and he's still in prison, so we should uh, remember him. And he uh, got imprisoned again for some reasons, but he was one of the persons who really uh, spoke in, in favor of Israel and good uh, Egypt Israeli relations. And then we had uh, this uh, woman, Alia Magda Mahdi. Ali, 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 Ali Mahdi, who's yes. actually Karim Amr's girlfriend. Yeah, okay, so. Yeah. The so first, we, the first person who went to prison for four years, she's his girlfriend. So she uh, became famous and uh, everyone read about her because she posted a photo of her naked uh, in, on, on the website. She posted naked on her blog. Yes. And there, um, there has been a lot of media coverage about this person. So can you tell me, I, I mean, the, the pure fact that the one is the girlfriend of the other can, shows that they are really a tiny minority. 
Um, but still, what role uh, do can can uh, individuals like them play, and what role can the international media coverage and solidarity campaigns for these very isolated individuals play? You you are provoking me into into bashing them. <laughs> Basically, well, I I make. I, I make this argument everywhere. I know Michael personally, I have translated a piece by Karim, I don't know him personally, but I've, I've, I've been published in the, in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, and I've had many discussions with friends in Egypt and outside Egypt about, about these individuals. What I'm going to say right now has nothing to do about their rights. Everybody has the right to express themselves, everybody has the right to do whatever they want, everybody... I, I believe in all that. I just said that I'm completely... Uh, I'm fully for Western-style freedom of expression. However, there's a huge difference between saying that somebody has a right to something and saying that this somebody is a hero for this thing. These are two different things. Um, I personally believe that, for example, Aliyah, who, who, who posed naked in, in her blog, she's, she's 19 years old. Okay? I think that this action is completely irresponsible. Okay? We, we are, in, in the name of these actions, the Islamists retaliate by banning everybody from saying anything. Um, everybody has a natural right to express themselves. But this natural right needs to be embedded in a law. And to defend the law to your own fellow countrymen, you have to defend something. And I cannot go out in the street and tell the Egyptians, that I am defending freedom of expression because of the right of people to get naked. Okay? I'm not saying people people will respond that freedoms cannot be divided and that and that principles cannot be compromised. Well, I tell you what, as I said, I'm I'm fully for the Western style thing, but the Western style freedom of expression or freedoms in general did not come in one day. The United States had slavery. I mean, Germany had laws that, that, that oppressed various things, let alone the, the, the little historical diversions that happened later on. But I mean, even in the in the course of normal history, you have you, it's not it's not a struggle that happens. It's not that sometime in 1650 somebody emerges and says, "Well, I am." You know, I'm blaspheming God and, and stripping naked and having a uh, 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 homosexual relationship at the same time. It doesn't happen this way. Didn't it happen exactly this way? That uh, there were some people, some rioters, you know, process of... Well, the, Gi Gi Giordano, so Bruno was, was Giordano Bruno was burned on a stake. No, it is. Some time ago. <laughs> yeah. But, but this is exactly the point. The point is, what I'm trying to say is that... Here, here it is. 70% of the people in Asia just voted Islamist. 70% of the people. Okay? These are normal, ordinary people. I have to convince them, I have to speak to them. And the way to speak to them is not to completely provoke them to kill me. Because they will kill me. Because this is, this is the way things happen. And it's, and it's risking people like me. I'm working on a proposal to defend, for example, Freedom of Assembly and Association. I'm working on a proposal to work on. Um, uh, just, just one second. I'm working on a proposal to to, to draft uh, uh, economic programs uh, that that, that I, I, to, to to challenge the Islamists what they are going to do. Now, is, don't you think that it's a distraction for me to leave all of this things that will appeal to the Egyptians in a certain way and 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 have to because I have to morally and ethically I have to defend Aliyah against the people who want to kill her. So it's just these these are marginal acts. I'm not saying do not challenge religion, I'm not saying do not challenge social values, but I'm, I'm saying challenge them in something that matters to most people. And so, it doesn't it doesn't help. It, doesn't it, it does not help, it distracts us. What I'm trying, once again, this is not to say that these people do not have the right to what they do. I, I had this discussion exactly with a friend of mine in the United States who is trying to help Aliyah get out of Egypt. Now, this is exactly what she has done. She is in a position where she actually has to leave. Mm -hmm. And, and she's, we're now in a, in a discussion about her father not giving her her passport and telling her that you're not leaving Egypt and then she's going to be put in prison and we're going to waste two years of our lives trying to get her out of prison mm -hmm. and... 
this is not what we, I mean, we, there, are, there are people who are taking over the entire country. This is not really the struggle that, I'm, that, I, that I should be doing right now. So, once again, these people are good people, and they have the right to whatever they want, but they should not be treated as heroes in the West. This is, this is what I'm trying to say. They should be helped, we should defend their rights, but they should not be called heroes. This, this also happened, uh, I mean, this has happened for, for uh, so, many, so many other examples. There was this Palestinian blogger, uh, I, don't, I don't know if you know the story, but these are struggles on the margin. We're talking about somebody who's going to enact the law to stone women and cut people's hands when they are uh, in accusations of theft. And, uh, and apply capital punishments to, to people that they consider to be atheists or apostates. So this is what is at stake. I cannot really... I mean, this is the, 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 the marginal fights are distractions to me. Um, I, I understand now, or I just want to ask you to specify that because... Um, I could interpret what you said as saying it was the, the act, for example, of the uh, Alia uh, was on a tactical level, it was not right. But of course, uh, when you, for example, when you write about anti Semitism as a, not as a problem of Israelis, but a problem of Egypt society, a very key problem which has to be solved if you want to come to some kind of democracy. Then, of course, I guess many of your liberal colleagues mm -hmm. who can write and write that stuff that's provoking um, the majority of the Egyptians. This is so such a um, hot topic. So I, I, I would just want to ask you, so um, if that is correct, then that would, that, that would also mean that women's rights will fight against Islamic gender apartheid would, would be on the same level, so if you can differ about tactics, but, but not about the, the content, no, that's, that it's, it's an uh, as important issue, uh, women in Islamic countries, as, for example, anti-Semitism. I'll, I'll say two things. The first thing is, um, I'm not once again, I'm not saying that people should not do whatever they think is the proper way of pursuing their causes. I'm just saying what the reaction should be on the other side of the Mediterranean or the other side of the ocean should be. That's, that's, that's my first comment. The second comment is, I might write about anti-Semitism. First of all, I'm not sure that, that the comparison holds. Anti-Semitism is not simply a problem of the Egyptians because it's ethical. I always say that everywhere in the United States with my Jewish friends everywhere. I'm not, def I'm not attacking anti-Semitism in Egypt because I want to defend the Jews ethically. This is the least of my causes. My, my major cause is that my fellow countrymen cannot think insofar as they believe every single evil in the world comes from uh, a Jewish conspiracy. This is, this is, I mean, the ethical thing is, of course, exists and it's the beginning. But I choose my priorities because I believe that the issue of anti-Semitism is perhaps the most important issue, ideological, social issue in Egypt at all, regardless of the situation of the Jews. Okay, that's one thing. Uh, uh, second thing, although I write about anti-Semitism, I have never been to Israel, and this is simply because my my I've been invited several times, but my a uh, travel permit that I take from the army says that I'm allowed to go everywhere in the world except Israel. Okay? Now, of course, everybody breaks this. Nobody cares, or nobody will know if you go to Israel. You can get a stamp outside of the passport. But I have not, I have not broken a law, and I actually keep to my, I mean, whenever somebody says, well, will you come to visit Israel? I say when I'm 30, because then I will not need a, a travel permit. And, I, and then I can come. Now, this is an argument I can sell to my countrymen, in a sense. This is the distinction between anti-Semitism and Israel. There are all kinds of... And most of the stuff that I do is actually right about 
why anti-Semitism is problematic. You know, I do not, you know, hold the bar mitzvah in Tahrir Square. Okay, so defending women's uh, gender, what you call the gender apartheid of Islamists, can also be done through writing. So, what, what I'm saying, if it's a, there's a huge difference between saying everybody has the right to strip naked on the internet and to actually do it, and because it's illegal in Egypt, okay? She's not only jeopardized, I mean, now you think it's an act of, you know, and she's, she's facing an oppressive society, but it's illegal. She can go to prison for it, okay? And, and now, I, 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 anybody, I mean, shall we hire lawyers? to change the law, and shall we all work on the, I mean, once again, there's a, there's a big difference. There's a big difference. And if, even if you, if, even if she is struggling for, against the gender apartheid, as the Islam is gender apartheid that you, that you talk about, isn't it more important to convince other women that such a situation exists? Once again, back to your question, the Muslim Brotherhood and Salafist women are voting in the same direction. I mean, we have a serious problem, and also among my, my feminist activist friends in Egypt, we always have this discussion. They have all these uh, workshops and discuss all of these things, and they cannot convince women. It's not that they cannot convince men, they cannot convince women that they, that they have equal rights. And equal rights to what? Once again, I mean, you have a country where women inherit half of what men inherit. This is a huge socio-economic problem, especially in Upper Egypt, okay? Now, even this law is not implemented in Upper Egypt in the rural, in the rural areas, men actually take the inheritance of women, okay? So instead of going and advocating for these women who are actually, some, some of them are on the verge of, you know, are, are very poor, the verge of subsistence, instead of doing that, we talk about, you know, post-colonialist, uh, you know, something comes from Julia Christopher, whatever. Um, so, so, there is a huge difference between, between doing shocking stuff because it's shocking and doing shocking stuff because it actually, it actually matters. Uh, I'm willing to go to prison for, 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 for talking about anti-Semitism. There's no law banning me from writing what I wrote. And I make sure that I keep to the law. But I'm, I'm also willing to go to prison for various things other than that. But there's no reason for a young woman who is only 19 to do this at all. I cannot, I cannot find a reason. And everybody who thinks that this is a legit, legitimate act of protesting is just throwing years of work down the drain. Does that make, I mean... You said before that we should stop with multiculturalism, so... I mean, I see a certain... Um, how do you say that? Contradiction. Yes, contradiction. I'm, I'm not relativist. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. I'm, I understand I'm, not, that. I'm not saying that people do not have the right to do that. I'm just saying that it's not heroic or revolutionary or changing anything. That's what I'm saying. Uh, once again, I said... I am working actively with people who try to save the lives of these people. I'm not, it's not that yes, I'm I know, I know. trying to kill them myself. But what you say now is they do small steps to convince uh, things and to... No, no, they, they, do, they do not do small steps. Mm -hmm. They do not do that. They no, do, I mean, you, they do you, you said you, they should. And they should have... No, 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 they shouldn't. Themselves. They do whatever they want. They do whatever they want. My major problem is that are they heroes or are they not? That's, that's all I'm saying. If she wants to strip naked, that's okay. It's up to her. The question is, is she the new liberal leader of Egypt? That's my question. For the West, she is. Yes. Okay, and here is how the Islamists forms the counter-argument. The Western civilization is about stripping naked. Respond to that. But that only shows oh, how little the West knows. Hmm? Yes. So what? That's it. It's about your freedom to do this. Yeah. Well, so what can the West do? In, 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 in this in particular? Uh, no, in general. 
Well, the, I, once again, I mean, there's, there's no, there's no homogenous entity called the West. Uh, I, th I have given up. I, uh, my organization does not take government money from any government. I don't, I don't like government money. Um, I think that the the only thing that should be that can be done is establishing networks of support with people that have concrete ideas. I mean. Uh, I work strictly, I mean in the United States, I work strictly with libertarian and conservative groups. I do not work with anybody else. Because this is what I, these are the ideas that I represent. I do not mind that others would work with the social democrats or with the democrats in the United States or more, more lefty groups. But I do not do that. Because I stand for certain ideas, specific ideas. What can the West do? The West can, first of all, I think that the most important thing can be more critical. Yeah. And not, not, not so huggy lucky go happy, happy go lucky, whatever they call it, about, uh, about every, I mean, uh, in, my, in, in our last article we said that for every Western journalist, every man, every male without a beard in Tahrir Square was no short of a John Stuart Mill, and every woman without a veil was no short of a Mary Wollstonecraft. So, be more critical. Especially with the people that you consider to be your allies, with the Democrats. Especially with the liberals, treat them with the, at the same level that you would treat your own. Force them to face scrutiny. Challenge their ideas. Read what they write. Do not worry too much about what happens to them because of what they write. I mean, this is this is my criticism to the entire Karim Amr thing. Free Karim, yes, of course. Once again, he has the right to do that. But who has read what Karim has written? What has he written? What, this is exactly my point. I mean, I know he said something very obscene or kind of... No, I mean, it's, 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 not, it's not that I'm saying that he shouldn't say that. I'm just saying, what are the other ideas that stand behind his argument? I mean, he has been blogging for... I mean, nobody has even thought about translating what he has written so that people can read it. So how do you know that he was saying the right stuff? In the first place. Excuse me, can I change, can I change the topic? Yeah. Because this is too, for me, too much self uh, looking in the question there. Um, can you t uh, revoke the time when uh, President Obama gave his famous Al Azhar speech? What did it have an uh, impact on uh, the, the government and on the people? And the second question would be when um, the State Department called for the resignation of Mubarak, was this something that was heard in, in the society? I'll tell you about another speech, a speech that Condoleezza Rice made in Egypt in 2005, mm -hmm. in the American University in Cairo, in 2004. That did change something. This was the, I mean, uh, this was the greatest challenge that was posed to the, uh, uh, the Mubarak uh, rule ever. I forget about all the protest movements and stuff. It was Condoleezza Rice who started this whole thing in the American University when she said that we are going to push for democracy in this country. And she said it in Egypt. This, this scared the hell out of the Mubarak people. And Mubarak did not go to Washington DC until Bush left, left, the, left, the, left office. The Obama speech in Cairo was really uh, it was, a, I mean, for me, it was a very difficult day. Just like today, I couldn't get a taxi. Uh, streets were empty. Uh, no restaurants were open. Because they shut everything down because of the security. The American president was there. But other than that, I did not really feel any impact. Uh, he, he, I mean, he, I, he, the, the, the Obama mania uh, was in Egypt as well as it was everywhere else. Uh, those who were uh, the democracy activists were so infused, despite the fact that he said absolutely nothing in the speech. The critics of the United States and the Western ways were outraged by the fact that he mentioned uh, that the Holocaust did happen, uh, which is, of course, we know that it both didn't happen and that it was a good thing. So this is how people think. In any case. Um, uh, so, the Obama speech had no impact whatsoever on anybody. 
And the whole Azhar thing, you know, Azhar is completely irrelevant. I mean, it's it's completely dominated by the Islamists in the lower ranks, but Sheikh Al Azhar is. And Mubarak didn't feel any need. By that. Well, first of all, Mubarak had, in this particular time, Mubarak himself had a personal tragedy. His grandson had died, and since since that point in time, it was I think two weeks before the Obama speech. Since that point in time, he was really removed and did not really did not really care about about anything. It was his first public appearance, and he had his arm like this. It was very... But if you're asking about the regime, the regime was absolutely happy that the Bush era was over, and that Obama has honored Egypt by choosing it as the center from which to talk to the Muslim world. And they knew for a fact that the speech is not going to... I mean, no matter what he said in the speech, is not going to be relevant. Uh, I think this was this was your first question. Second question was about the impact about the, the step down. Uh, absolutely irrelevant. Absolutely irrelevant. I mean, we we know very little little about the conversations that took place mm -hmm. between. And this is what really matters between the DOD, the Department of Defense, mm -hmm. and the Egyptian military. This is what matters. Actually, the the um, the chief of staff, Sami Hanen, who uh, was the second man after Fantawi today in Egypt was on his way to Washington on the 25th of January and was called back. So they asked the, the, the plane to actually turn around <clears throat> and go back. We, don't, we know very little about that. Forget about the State Department. The State Department says whatever it wants to say. But, uh, and, and, and the, really, uh, <coughs> especially in, in, uh, in, uh, after Obama came over, the, the Mubarak regime did not really care about what the Americans thought. Um, but did the, did the uh, from what we heard later on from uh, personal connections and whatsoever, that the Americans did not did, did, did not really say anything. They did not say stay or leave. Mm -hmm. And uh, just for your own, uh, just for the confirmation here, Mubarak stepped down because he decided to step down. This is something that everybody should know. He took the decision to step down. He at least had uh, had the uh, had, had he had the opportunity of staying there for a very long time. He was not forced by the military to retire, to 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 leave, mm -hmm. at all. These are all fictitious stories. He just couldn't take it anymore, and decided that he's leaving. So, okay, maybe you, we have some more questions. Then maybe we can uh, close this round. And uh, continue the discussion somewhere else. But. Yes, uh, two questions, please. Um, how should Europe deal with the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafis now? How, how are we supposed to deal with them? John Kerry flew down, talked to them, got <laughs> beat up, of course, at home. But Western countries, I mean, European countries, they have a more pragmatic approach. So, so what should we do with these folks? Question one. Question two. Can I just answer because I keep yes. forgetting the question. Oh, good, 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 please. Uh, the, uh, not to, uh, we should give the, the, the Western governments should give the Islamists a lukewarm reception. Not too hot, not too cold. Okay? Too hot and I'm huggy and happy about you and you are great is going to be problematic and too cold is going to be also problematic. Okay. Because they gain in both cases. They gain actual influence and uh, uh, deals and, and stuff like that if you're treating them as, as equal partners. And they gain popular support if you oppose them. So what I would say is love them in public, hate them in private. And in terms of policies, in terms of talking to them in public, in terms of talking to them rank-wise, should presidents and chancellors talk to them or should it be more of a... No, you, you, you should you should talk to officials, not not to parties. This is right. the, I mean when, when they have when there's an Islamist prime minister or an Islamist president, talk to him as president. Right. But the parties themselves, there's nothing to be gained from dealing with the parties themselves. They will always get you the people that can talk to you, not not the people that you want to talk to. Okay. So that's the yeah. first question. Second question. Excellent. The second one, you, you said something about a, a little bit already. How to support the so-called liberals now in Egypt. 
how do we actually support? There's a lot of money waiting in Europe to be spent in Egypt and other North African countries. What are we supposed to do? Well, I, 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 I have, I have my, uh, my bias is very clear. Think tanks, think tanks, think tanks, think tanks. That's, that's basically my bias. The, the problem that we are facing in Egypt is that, and I, I, I told this to my liberal colleagues, I told this to my Western friends, the problem is that we do not have ideas. We do not have clear proposals. We do not have nothing to tell the Egyptians. It's not that the Egyptians are ignorant or being fooled or that the Islamists have mosques or that they have Saudi money. The problem is that liberals have nothing to say. Okay. <laughs> Simply that. I mean, nothing to say. Not, 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 not on the economic front, not on the political front, not on the ethical front, nothing. Why? I don't understand why they wouldn't have anything. Because we have, we have, I mean, I did not want to go through this because we, we have this thing that I call attitude yeah, liberalism. <laughs> no, I mean, we have this thing that we call attitude liberalism which is, if you drink, have a girlfriend, and is not an Islamist, I mean, or you, you know, maybe you blaspheme a little bit, that's, that's what a liberal is, okay? And in the past few years, with the American money flooding in, you are also a democracy activist, and this thing is called a liberal, okay? Now, I'm, I'm, I mean, when I talk to people, I mean, I, 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 as I said, I just written something in Arabic yesterday, my first in a very long time. I normally do not write in Arabic, uh, and uh, in, in our blog, and it received a very good reception. I did not expect it, um, but uh, what I, when I start talking with people about numbers, they freak out. They say not numbers do not matter. Mm -hmm. What matters is that uh, when I talk about how good the economic situation, how better the economic situation was, mm -hmm. was getting in the last six years, people would respond liberals would respond, but the, but the individual did not feel that this was going on. How do I interpret that? <laughs> okay, I'm, t I'm telling you that there was 7.2% uh, growth in 2008. I'm telling you that the Gini coefficient is lower than the, the, uh, the Gini coefficient. Uh, the uh, inequality index in Egypt is lower than, than that of the United States. I'm telling you that unemployment in Egypt was, that, was like that of Sweden in 2010. I'm telling you that, that the, the, this is the, the country where the, where the price of bread was, was... I mean, how did the citizen not feel that improvement or not feel the state intervene from him when you can buy bread cheaper than any other place in the world? When you can buy gas at, 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 at a price that is lower than that, the people that produce oil. One-tenth of the price that you pay in Germany. Can you imagine? One-tenth of the price that you pay in Germany. So, <coughs> when you talk to people about numbers, <laughs> let alone programs based on these numbers, people freak out. No, we just want to have fun. So, how many think tanks do you think do exist? How many liberal think tanks exist in Egypt? Just give, give me an estimate. It doesn't. Zero. Zero. Okay, my, my organization, we're trying to be the first. I mean, we actually chose our slogan, if not us, who, if not now, when? Because basically, nobody else is doing the job. We're not qualified. You know, I'm, I, I, I study philosophy. I don't know anything about economics, but I have to do it. Because nobody else is. I mean, the World Bank is doing it. The government used to do it. But now the carrot is in prison. So, but nobody else is doing it. So, if you have a lot of money, invest in ideas. Invest in, 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 in books. Invest in education. I mean. Look at the German university in Cairo. Who needs 3,000 engineers more? I mean... German, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about the German, not, not the German university here, I'm talking about the German university in Cairo. We want to get an educated engineers. For what? There is a shortage. <laughs> <laughs> to work here. No, I mean... Uh, uh, the American University in Cairo, for example, is one of the, I mean, this, this should be, I mean, you don't only have a cultural center, you have a university, one of the oldest, and I'm talking about the Americans, you have a university, one of the oldest in the region, and it's one of the worst grounds, I mean, it's, you will find all kinds of, the, the, the man who heads the political science department, or at least who used to head it, the political science department is a Marxist, 
the man who leads the, the, the <laughs> economics, the, the man who leads the economic economics department at the American University of Cairo is a pan Arabist. He believes in socialism, corporatism, stuff like this. So I'm, I'm serious. I mean, a, 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 another example. Talk about talk about anti-Semitism. Joel Benin, who is who is uh, a, a, an anti-Zionist, communist, Jewish person. Okay, an anti-Zionist, communist. Hmm. Teaches at, at uh, Stanford was was called into Egypt to the American University in Cairo to hit the Middle East Department, uh, the Middle East Institute. Uh, no, you, you, this is not even the problem. The problem is that he's fired because he's Jewish. Okay, so this is what I'm talking about. Okay, and, and, and so a lot of money. There are a lot of venues the money could go to other than monitoring elections and capacity building and all these things that I do not really understand. So, this one last, there was yeah, one last question. I was going to ask you about numbers, actually. So, what, what would be your proposal to economic change? Because Islamists, they don't have economic recipes, as far as I can see. In, I mean, they try to introduce Islamic banking, which abolishes uh, the monetary system, basically. So, it's rather going down, so what would be your proposal? Well, I actually disagree with you that the Islamists do not have a program. The Islamists are the only ones who look like having a program. I mean, they have just introduced, the Muslim Brotherhood just published a 94-page program, the only one that I have seen before the elections, 94-page program that has a few details about, about, uh, about um, economics. Uh, nobody else has done anything that is even similar. I'm not saying that the brother, that the program, the brotherhood program is okay, but I'm just saying that they are the only yeah, ones who have what looks like a program. But they have this Islamic finance program, but it doesn't work in the West. They do not propose Islamic finance, actually. They don't. No. Because no. they do in Libya and Tunisia and Nigeria. Of course. So. I mean, but in, in the brotherhood doesn't. The Salafis are. But let me put it this way. The, the problems, uh, first of all, Islamic banking or Islamic finance is really not that different. I mean, it just calls things different names. Mm -hmm. so it's not so that different. It's called Sadaqa. Yeah. So, uh, and I, 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 the Islamists have no great, great interest in economics, really. Yeah. But by necessity, because they are ideologues. They would give it to technocrats to run it. Uh, once they find out that there are Certain things like there's a central bank that we have to run, there's a money quantity uh, policy that we have to take care of. They will just say, well, we'll get the technocrats to do it. We don't care about it. It's, but the economy is going downhill not because of that. I mean, the economy is going downhill because of the, what I call the Jacobin trend that exists more among the liberals than, I mean, the Islamists are the friends of free market economy, believe it or not. The seculars are extremely opposed to free market economy. Everybody wants minimum wage, maximum wage, uh, you know, uh, what, unemployment benefit, uh, all the kinds of things that, that, that you have in Europe, but at least you have economies to support. I mean, I, I don't know where your politics stand, but I'm very I'm to the right when it comes to, to the economy. So, but uh, the Egyptian economy cannot stand these things. When you, when you, when, Really, and uh, once again, you have you have a broken system of subsidies. One fourth of government expenditure is going to subsidies. Uh, enormous number, uh, and um, and it's and it's and people want more of that. More dependency on the state, more uh, much less work. Of course, the Islamist in power means that tourism is going to be affected. Uh, there will be not only uh, less investment, but also capital flight. People will take their money away, especially cops. And, and, uh, and uh, cops do have a lot of, uh, I mean, they have a fair share of, of businesses in Egypt. So uh, the economy is going to collapse for, 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 for different reasons. And the idea, I mean, once again, this is why I say invest in think tanks, think tanks, think tanks, is that somebody needs to speak to the Egyptians and tells them that we actually, we are actually taxed by government. We are the ones who create wealth, not the government. And the government takes taxes to perform services. It's not the other way around, because the Egyptians do not get that. They have the Gulf frontier state model, where they believe that the state gets wealth, they make money, and they give it to us. <laughs> And if we don't get any money, then we're being stolen. 
And so this is exactly what people, this is how people think of this. And so to change this mentality is a lot of work. You need proposals, and you need, you know, you need to create. I haven't seen a discussion of the Egyptian economy in TV ever. I wouldn't say I wouldn't say in the past ten years or something. Never. Nobody discusses it. 